know, as a, like I said, the theme today is God is the gospel. You know, it's amazing, too, just because, you know, as we see God the Father, then we say Christ is God. And then we say Christ is God's son. <laughs> you hear that? God is Father. Christ is God. And Christ is God's son. You know, you see the hand of God and you, you when you, if you really meditate upon that, you'll see the, impossi the possibilities. All things are possible with God. There's nothing impossible for him. And he knows what he was doing in the process of redemption and his providence for the redemption of mankind, namely bringing, giving of himself, stepping down out of eternity, clothing himself with human flesh, and with the purpose to die for you and for me. You see? So I pray today that, you know, as we sit here today, that we will do a self-examination for those of you who don't know Christ. I pray at the end of this judgment, in time, that you will come to grips with your sin before God today, because that's what it's all about. It's not about how good you are. You couldn't be good enough. Just come to God as you are. Bring it all with you, you say, your baggage. You know about it. He died for it. It's paid. So the thing is that as we go through the message today, you know, I, I just encourage you to just examine your hearts today. You know, those of us that don't know Christ, I pray that today, the day of salvation for you. And those of us that do know Christ, I pray that we make a recommitment to Christ. He's God. He, his arms is always open wide, you know. So it's, he doesn't nullify the factor that even in his providence, that we have a choice in the matter. We have to act. He wants the free will, the act of your will, through repentance and faith. Remember that today. So, you know, the thing is, everything has a beginning. You know, bad news first. Bad news. You know, we all knew that the bad news. Over 6,000 years ago, you know, we know that when God, Adam lived in perfect unity, perfect, perfection with God. You know, and it goes to show you that the God gives an abundance. He told Adam of every tree in the garden you can partake of. But he pointed over here and said, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, do not partake of it. For in the day that you do, you will die. You know, I mean, that right there is enough to, if, if there's an abundance. How many of us can testify to that very thing that though we have an abundance, we want to testify? We want to test the forbidden. We always deal with the forbidden. You know, I know many of I've heard some say, too, that, well, you know, if I'd have been there, I wouldn't have did that. I say, not so. If, you were, if we were there, we'd have did the very same thing. Disobeyed God. And because of that, world and death through sin. You know, uh, but you know, the thing is that just to show you what we try to do, too, we try to when Adam and Eve, and what God is showing us when they tried to cover themselves with fig leaves. Fig leaves is not enough to cover yourself. We try to cover ourselves with those fig leaves of good work. Well, we say we're going to come to church, only come to church. We're going to do this, we're going to do that, but we miss, we miss the most important by taking it to the foot of the cross. See? That's what's more important. And then come the gratitude that I come and I fellowship with the, in the corporate part of the congregation of believers with the heart of gratitude. See? But first thing first, remember that it said that Christ come that he might bring us to God. So if I come to church without, going to, without dealing with my sins in Christ, I'm just in a building, right? Okay, church don't say it. I want you to know that. Church attendance doesn't save. Baptism doesn't save, but it's a requirement. Remember. You know, good work for sure. Well, you know, we have nothing good in ourselves, period, apart from Christ. You know, I just like to let the Word of God testify to that because, you know, when God gives us a description of ourselves, you know, we need to hear what God's description and condition of man, lost humanity is. You know, in Romans chapter 3, starting at verse 10, I'll just read it. You know, you don't have to turn it if you don't want to, but if you 
Dude, go ahead. You know, and it says, as it is written, I pray that everyone hear this, there's no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have become worthless. There's no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The parson of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways, and the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. That's God's description of mankind apart from him. But you see, I know that most of us, if we, if we are honest with ourselves, we see ourselves in this when we were apart from Christ. And sometimes as we allow the flesh, in, when we in Christ, we allow the flesh to take precedence over the spirit. So, you know, God's description of this right here is letting, us, letting mankind know the, his condition. You know, I need to share with you that, yes, the Bible says that we are sinners. See? But do we sin because we are sinners? No, we sin because it's our nature. That's the part God is showing us right here. The hopelessness, the powerlessness to save ourselves and our need of him. You know, you do an honest assessment of yourself with God and, you know, we can, we can sit and deny and say, well, this is not me. Uh, this, well, you know, I don't, but God has said this. You know, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 64, verse 6, he says, we are as, as an unclean thing. And our righteousness is that filthy rag. So that's saying to me right there that apart from Christ, my best goodness is not good enough. Nothing in me is good enough. You see? So the thing is that we can deceive ourselves and be deceived into trusting ourselves you know, I often say that if we, if, if there's such, something so good and mean that I can do so good, then why did Christ have to come and die? Why did Christ have to come and die if I can find it in me? I can't find nothing in me apart from the work of God in my life. Faith is a gift. All these things are gifts of God. Repentance is a gift. That God gives them. But most of all, I just want to draw your mind back to it. The greatest gift is God himself. See, so that's the very thing that we need to understand. You know, and, you know, the Bible is so clear. That's why I love to take the word of God and I let the word of God speak for itself, you know, of our condition. You know, when Adam sinned, I shared with you. But the, also when, and what came into the world and what happened. But in Ephesians chapter 2, Verse 1, it says to me, it told me this, it said, and you, you know, to anyone that has the Bible open, it's speaking to them, and a believer. It says, and you, who were dead in your trespasses and sins, he has made alive. I want, I want to share something with everyone in here, so you want, with the ones that don't know Christ, and you want to play Russian roulette with your soul. The Bible just spoke to you. That... You were dead in your trespasses and sins. That means that when I, <laughs> one time the Lord, when he gave me a sermon, it was called Dead Man Walk. You might be physically alive, but the thing is, without Christ, you are spiritually dead. Don't, don't, in that condition, don't die in that condition is what God is saying. Why the opportunity, yet is why the daylight dawns. And yet while your heart is tender, you know, receive, turn from your sins, turn and receive by faith that gift. Christ is your own, what he did for you and that alone. Don't trust and lean on nothing. It's like I lean on this thing here for support. That's what you have to do. Nothing of myself. I put my total weight upon here to hold me up. And that's what we do because we're sure what Christ promised he will fulfill. He will bring the past. 
you know, so the thing is that that's what it's about, that the God is the gospel to bring us back to God, to bring God, bring us back to himself, that he reconciled us to Christ back to himself because it hurt God. <laughs> it hurts God. I want you to understand. God, it hurts God. He loves us. As I shared earlier, here's the vast universe. There's planets huge among us. Here's the planet Earth. This is how big it is if you look at it, the Earth, if you go to space. It might look, but if you compare it with the, the galaxies and the, and the other planets, this is the way Earth looks. Now, we ask ourselves a question, why such giant planets in the big universe? But guess what? God's love is on this little planet. It's whole love. He came and he died because of this, for this little planet. See? And that's why it, it goes well when it says, what is man that you are mindful of? See? So the thing is that those of us that don't know Christ today, I pray in my heart. My purpose is to see lives turn to God, that lives been saved and hearts being turned and lives been changed and turned back to Christ. You can't go wrong. It don't take money. You don't, if you're looking at it for money, that it's going to be pieces and cream. No, don't think like that. Look what our Lord had to endure to go through it for the redemption. But if you're sharing his suffering, the whole key that we share in his suffering you know, that the very thing that him as a man, he suffered in the flesh to show us as an example that we can be done with sin. You know, I shared this with you. You know, we have a way that we want to always compare ourselves. You know, someone can do a great sin over here. Oh, you say, I, man, I would never do that right there. But here you walk across the street and tell the biggest lie that you can ever tell. But you're saying that that man over there did the sin worse than me. All I did was lie. But what do God call it? <laughs> whether you murder, whether you lie, it's all sin to God. So the, the thing is that we draw the point that none of us are better than the other. Before God, it's always one word, sin. Whether I steal, whether I lie, whatever it be, whether I murder, it's sin to God. But yet, you know, that is always the factor of bad news. Yeah, that's the bad news. We do, but the good news is that God. Let's say that, but God. <laughs> See, that's the key. But God. Say no. God said no. He said I love them too much. I'm not going to do it, but I'm not going to nullify that I want the free will offering. I want the act of the free will. I want to see that how my love is and let it come back to me in that love. That love, you look at it on the cross, and then love returns back. See? So, you know, and turn with me, please. We're just going to, and we're standing at the reading of the word of John chapter 316, and we're going to read John 316 in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Amen when you give me amen when you get there? Amen. Okay. And you know that, and this is what I want us all to read together in the corporate body, okay? 316 together, okay. Let's go. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Now let's turn over to Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Yeah, 5, 8. And, and when we read this one, let's all make an emphasis on that word. But. Yeah, amen. All right, let's read it together. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us or for the ungodly. But God. But God. Like God. For God. For God. <laughs> Amen. 
Do y'all hear that? But God, for God. See? For God so love, for God, but God demonstrates. He's demonstrated. Yes, yeah, God, Jesus. That's my name, God said forever. That's that name that I was set. Jesus is the name that I was set because Jesus means, that name means the Lord saved. That's what it means. It's not a just a name, just a title of office. It's a thing of, of power who he has authority of. That name, Jesus, means that he has the power to save. He came to save. Christ meant anointed, one sent. See, so God wants you to see only if you got a son. I have a son. And I say, son, I need you to go down to the office for me, work for me today. Then it took, that's my son, right? I sent my son to do a task, right? Now, through the Holy Spirit, he impregnated Mary. I just want to show you how God's power works. Now, that being a child and a baby, right? God, the Holy Spirit, impregnated Mary, right? So that makes it be what to God? But yet, let me show you something that's amazing. But yet, who is it in there? <laughs> Can you see? Look at that amazing. You see that? <laughs> I tell you, when I think about that, it just really didn't move me. I mean, I was in the office. And, wow, this is something to see how powerful God is and what he do. So you, if God is able to do that, don't you know these are mediocre things in your life? Don't you know that he's able, what he's able to do with you? What he did with you? God is not concerned about the, so much of the things and the elements of this life and what this, that, and other. Yes, he provides. But God has provided the greater after this is said and done. Jesus says, I go away and I prepare a place for you. Because God said, I'm going to do away with this. You know, it just never, I can write down a message all day, but I know the Holy Spirit has his way to go and to touch the heart of any. That's because of the trust. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not me. I have nothing in me. All I am is a, just a, a vessel broken that the Lord can feel. You know, so the thing is that by his word, what he says, and when I think about it, it, it just amazes me that how, how God is. And, and you just see that the impossibilities of God, God, everything with God is possible. God can speak a word right now in a book. But thank God he don't do it that way because as big as this building is, is how big our head it gets. So God deals with us in the process. And sometimes he uses trials and error to do so. So that's the thing. It's not just with trials, God does use it to bring us to our better, to our good, to build us up. So if you're going through a storm, or if you're going through a trial, don't say, oh, me, oh, my. Just know, look over to your side and say, wait, well, the one that's with you is in it. You know, because if you're not in a trial, you're coming out of one, or you're going back into one. In this life. So it's only set to make you see the two things. That's it. Turn you to God or it to make you better. So that's why it says that God says, turn to me. Turn to me and be saved, turn. So you know, as we look and we see now that we see who the gospel is, because it all says God, didn't it? It all begins with God in the Garden of Eden. He come out in the coolest of the day to sit with his friends. You know, God wants to come out in the coolest of the day and sit with you. That's why he made, like, made access, that Christ has made access, that at any time, while we're walking down the street, whatever the pain we go through, whatever the concern, we can just see I don't feel. You can talk to him. You can talk to him. And in Christ, he looked at you in the same way that he looked at day and Adam, at Adam when he used to be, when he was in perfect fellowship. Because it's because of Christ. When God, you are in Christ. And the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I think it's at verse 13 or 14, it says. At the last verse, it says, in the 14, it says, it's because of God that you are in Christ. Y'all hear that? Because of God that you are in Christ. 
It's just it's amazing if you just really just take time and, and just meditate upon the awesome of God and you start to, but the thing in the process of this right here we're talking about, God impregnated Mary with himself and then, but yet Jesus coming and that's his son. And people, but you know, you have to look to God to see who he is first in order to get the understanding of it. And know that possibly that God is nothing with him that is possible. God can do what he wants to do, how he want to do it, when he want to do it. There's nothing that God cannot do. He took us, in number one, he spoke the word. And when we come in Christ, he turned us from a sinner and said, now, I give you a new name. You are a saint, according to the word of God. See, he speaks. It's not that we are righteous in our own self, in our flesh. But God said, I have imputed my righteousness to you. See? And when God says something, who God says you are, you are. And what God says you have, you have. You can stand on that. And God doesn't go back on his word. He honors his word above his name. You can bank on that. And it says, all that come to me that calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know, so the thing is, that's I just wanted to break the ice with you. You know, I don't know. I got a little bit caught on fire more when I sit in the office and I come out the second service. You never know what the Holy Spirit has, but he just let him lead. And I pray that he pressed it upon the hearts and minds of men and women in this house that need him. Men and women that in him and that we have failed that God don't lead you down. He says, though a righteous man or woman falls seven times, they won't remain down. That means God pursues his children, and he lifts his children above it all. He don't leave us in that kind of condition. God is in charge of everything. Your life, his grace is sufficient. See, the thing is, his grace is sufficient. Matter to your failure, Paul failed, he said it in Romans chapter 7, verse 14. He gives you the scripture. The things I hate to do, those things I do. Kind of puzzled Paul. I'm a Christian, but wait a minute, why am I? But he looked up and he and it resulted in praise. Thanks be to God in Christ Jesus that in spite of all that and all this mess that I do, God has placed me in Christ. You see? So that's the thing. It's about Christ. It's about not about us. It's amazing that God can think about us in spite of ourselves. In a bad condition. That he loved me so much that he gave his all. I just want to read something from my footnotes right here. You know, from Romans chapter 5, verse 8. It says that, the extent of God's love is shown in the fact that Christ died for men in whom there was nothing that invoked that love. We had nothing in ourselves to invoke God's love. It's because he loved us because of who he is, and that's what about no matter what we have done. God wants to, that's, that's, a, that's a love far beyond anything that I can come, come in. We had nothing in ourselves to invoke that love, but God created us in that love, and God protects us in that love, but God doesn't nullify our choice in that love. We must receive that love and walk in that love, and re that love and the fact of knowing it, that it returns back, because when you love God, you love what God loves, and what do God love? Thank you very much. But what do God hate? Sin. There you go. Okay. And that's why we say God is the gospel. And that's why we come and we find the good news of God is bringing us back to himself and giving us at the end of it all, when it's said and done and we get home, who are we back with? Jesus. Jesus, God, Jesus, God, Jesus. <laughs> but that's the fact that we understand that we'll be safely and secure back at home to with the Lord and the way that he had planned it from the beginning. So I pray that it's a blessing for everyone. You know, it's a day, it's a day, it's a day of communion, you know, and, and it's a wonderful thing to bring the gospel because of the fact that Christ, we have the remembrance of what Christ did for us. You know, so I'm gonna ask the ushers, if they will, to come around and we can, and everyone to have you remain seated in the ushers to direct you to where you need to.